Hello, I'm Aaron Lore, and this is the Endocraduz Podcast. Recently, the Endocrine Society published a new clinical practice guideline entitled Treatment of Hypercalcemia of Malignancy in Adults, an Endocrine Society Clinical Practice Guideline. What exactly is hypercalcemia of malignancy? What are its symptoms? How is it treated? And what do the guidelines recommend? To help us answer those questions, joining me today is Dr. Gada el Haj Fulayan. She is Professor of Medicine at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon, and she is the chair of the working group that developed this guideline. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Aaron. I'm really excited to be here, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-chair, Dr. Matthew Drake from the Mayo Clinic, as well as my colleagues on the writing committee panel, without whom this would not have been possible. So hypercalcemia of malignancy really refers to elevation in the serum calcium level. It is the most common metabolic complication of malignancies. Hypercalcemia of malignancy occurs in 2 to 30% of malignancies depending on the cancer type, typically breast, lung, renal cell cancer, multiple myeloma, and also depending on the stage. The more advanced the cancer is, the more is the likelihood to develop hypercalcemia of malignancy. In many cases, these malignancies secrete potent substances that can cause bone resorption and thus the release of calcium from bone into the circulation, elevating serum calcium level. Very often in many of these tumors, such as breast and lung, the compound is called PTHRP. There may be other circulating cytokines. In some instances, it could be the active form of vitamin D, or it could be in certain parathyroid carcinoma, parathyroid hormone itself. When serum calcium goes up because of mobilization from the bone, it overwhelms the capacity of the kidneys to excrete it and thus can cause kidney impairment, dehydration, renal failure, and hypercalcemia. So what do we know about its association with morbidity and mortality? So this condition can lead to osteoporosis because of the withdrawal of calcium from bone, debilitating fractures, I just mentioned renal failure, Mm -hmm. but also decreased quality of life. And the morbidity is therefore quite high. The mortality was around 50% in five months. It's much Mm -hmm. better now because of the advent of better chemotherapeutic agents and also drugs to treat hypercalcemia of malignancy. One recent study suggested that the median length of stay is estimated at four days and in-hospital mortality has decreased to 6.8%. And if we're looking at some symptoms that might be associated with hypercalcemia, what might some of those symptoms be? We talked a little bit when we talked about morbidity, but the symptoms depend on the severity of the calcium elevation and the rapidity of the rise of the serum calcium. So mild elevation may cause constipation and fatigue, but more severe symptoms, the calcium above 12, reaching 14, 15, 16, can lead to polyuria, polydipsia, impaired cognitive function, confusion, coma, arrhythmias, and ultimately death. So now that we have a good idea of what hypercalcemia of malignancy is and its symptoms, why did the Endocrine Society decide that now was the time for a clinical practice guideline? Well, hypercalcemia of malignancy is a condition accompanied by high morbidity and mortality. And despite the advent and approval of several drugs that can inhibit the effect of these substances in resorbing bone and the treatment of hypercalcemia, there are currently no guidelines, no clinical care pathways to guide the stakeholders taking care of such patients. Furthermore, the evidence comparing the efficacy of the various drugs head-to-head comparison was sorely missing. So this was a perfect opportune time to basically try to understand where we stand and how to fill that knowledge gap. What is the traditional treatment of hypercalcemia of malignancy? Classically, first thing to do is to try to flush the calcium down the kidney. So hydration with normal saline, and of course, a potent drug to decrease bone resorption because a common pathway, as I said, is bone resorption. Possibly calcitonin because it could bridge that early effect where there is a gap between the onset of the 
effect of the potent drugs such as the bisphosphonate and the decrease in serum calcium. So hydration, calcitonin, and bisphosphonate were the older treatments available. If the type of cancer we have is one that produces the active metabolite of vitamin D calcitriol, glucocorticoids are given to inhibit the effect of calcitriol on enhancing gut absorption. More lately, over the last 15 years, denosumab has come around the block and has been an extremely successful, potent anti-resorptive drug. Last but not least, in the treatment of parathyroid carcinoma, calcium emetics, drug that mimic calcium, suppress parathyroid hormone secretion synthesis and help in the control of hypercalcemia. So this is kind of our armamentarium of drugs available up till now. Let's bring it back to the guideline. What exactly does the guideline specifically address? And what would you say are some of the most important recommendations? First of all, I think what's very important in these guidelines is that they were tailored to address the pathophysiology. What is the mechanism for the hypercalcemia? And therefore, if the mechanism is a very potent PTHRP-like substance, the first four recommendation will revolve around that. And basically, the first one is, if you have a patient with hypercalcemia of malignancy, do you just give saline and observe, or do you give a drug? And obviously, the strong recommendation was you have to treat such patient because of the mortality and morbidity, either with a bisphosphonate or with denosumab. And that is the only recommendation in the set of recommendation we came up with that is very strong based on the high likelihood of mortality and morbidity, despite the lack of profuse evidence that we cannot watch with saline, we have to treat with potent drugs such as bisphosphonate or denosumab. The other things I want to highlight is severity of hypercalcemia. And if the hypercalcemia is severe, one of our recommendations say don't wait for the effect of the intravenous bisphosphonate or denosumab to kick in. This usually takes 24 to 48 hours. Start with calcitonin, although it's a weak anti-resorptive drug. And again, although the evidence is not very strong, but it could help bring the calcium level a bit and bridge that period where we're waiting for the potent drugs to act. And then last but not least, what do you do for patients who have refractory recurrent hypercalcemia who are being treated with the intravenous bisphosphonate? And here we say, well, certainly what you need to do is follow that up with denosumab, which is a potent drug rather than just continuing or observing on the IV bisphosphonate. So this is kind of the general set of guidelines. And then we have some guidelines targeted to specific malignancies. One of them, of course, is calcitriol producing malignancy, malignancies that produce, as I said before, the active metabolite. And in such cases, we have to also help our management treatment with glucocorticoid therapy. This is for patients who have hypercalcemia due to calcitriol. You give them glucocorticoid in addition to either bisphosphonate or denosumab. Now, with regards to parathyroid carcinoma, and we already said the drugs are potent bisphosphonate and denosumab as cornerstone therapy. But in addition, we have now the calcium emetic. It's a drug that acts like calcium on the calcium sensing receptor in the parathyroid gland, suppresses PTH secretion synthesis, and therefore decreases PTH level, which was the mechanism by which bone resorption was taking place. We did not find any evidence to favor calcium emetic versus bisphosphonate versus denosumab. So therefore, our recommendation for parathyroid carcinoma was either one of these three drugs would be fine. And then if we started with one of these drugs, for example, calcium emetic, and the patient did not respond, we would follow with denosumab or with an IV bisphosphonate. Conversely, if we decided to start with a potent antiresorptive such as denosumab or bisphosphonate, and there was no good response, we could follow up with a calcium emetic. So this was kind of a very brief summary. The recommendations are very nicely crafted, and the evidence in the whole set uh, in the document are very uh, rigorously reviewed, vetted with pros and cons, and you know, outlining the gaps. It's a brief summary, but even in that, we get a good hint at just how complex it can be to treat hypercalcemia and malignancy. If you were to think of what some of the biggest challenges are in treating it, what comes to the top of the list for you? 
Challenges would be the fact that we, we have potent drugs, but they're not 100% efficacious. So refractoriness is one of them, and recurrence is another one. And we really um, don't have anything else on the horizon now. They may be some drugs we're hoping in the future that would improve uh, the status of our current management. But I think recurrence and refractoriness would be the, the big one to think about. Are there any characteristics that make this specific guideline unique? So what makes these guidelines particularly unique are a couple of things. One is this specific guidelines was supported by two rather than the usual single systematic review, one for evidence of benefits and harms, and the other one for contextual factors regarding values, preferences, acceptability, feasibility, cost, cost effectiveness, and equity. And the other uniqueness is that these guidelines were co-sponsored by two other major organizations, the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research and the European Society of Endocrinology. Now, with regards to the specific recommendation, I'd like to point out to the workflow that is part of the guidelines document that links severity and rapidity of serum calcium rise, basically characteristics of the hypercalcemia and pathophysiology of the hypercalcemia with the specific recommendation. So it's a really nice user-friendly way to know how to navigate hypercalcemia of malignancy. And the other thing that the guidelines have provided is in addition to what is in the text proper itself, additional resources on the website, including case studies that illustrate the recommendations, pocket guides, et cetera. And last but not least, it's very important to underscore that fundamental to the management of hypercalcemia of malignancy is consideration of surgical therapy of the primary malignancy and chemotherapy of the primary malignancy, which are going to be instrumental in preventing the occurrence of hypercalcemia and the recurrence of hypercalcemia. I think we've done a fantastic job today of giving a good lay of the land of the current state of hypercalcemia of malignancy and its treatment and this wonderful guideline. I always like to look to the future too, though. How do you hope treatment of hypercalcemia malignancy will evolve over the next five to 10 years? Well, there is no doubt that this huge amount of work has identified several knowledge gaps. And it was really sobering to find out that we still don't know, uh, for example, how to compare IV bisphosphonate to sub Q denosumab. What is the long term safety and efficacy of these drugs? There is some concern that with denosumab, after stopping the drug, you could get a rapid bone loss and fractures. So we have knowledge gaps that we now know must address. That's number one. And we really hope that there will be initiatives to close these knowledge gaps to formulate stronger and better evidence based guidelines in the future. In addition, I really hope, but I don't have anything specific on the horizon, but we do hope that there would be additional drugs that would be more potent, more long-lasting, less side effects, of course, because with these potent anti-resorptive drug, chronic therapy is tied to long-term AEs, rare but worrisome, such as atypical femoral fractures and osteonecrosis of the jaw. This has been a fantastic discussion. For those of you who are listening, who are interested, we will link to the clinical practice guideline that we've been talking about today in the description of today's episode. You can click on that and go and find it. Gada, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you. A pleasure. Thanks, Aaron. And that's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. As I said earlier, we'll link to the Endocrine Society's clinical practice guideline on hypercalcemia of malignancy in today's episode description. I'd like to take a moment to thank our editor, Andrew Harmon. He edits every one of these episodes, and I don't want to think about what this podcast would be without him. Thanks, Andrew. We can't do this without you. We'll be back soon with another fantastic dive into the world of endocrinology. Until then, thanks for listening. Endocrine News Podcasts are a free service of the Endocrine Society. To learn more or to become a member, visit the Society's website at www.endocrine.org.